this year's. Hi, everybody. Welcome and good evening. My name is Zinat Rahman. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics. We are so pleased to welcome you today to a discussion regarding the break, a breakdown of this year's election results and a preview of the 2022 midterm elections. Before one of our students formally introduces our guests in a few minutes, I want to mention a few upcoming events that we have because um, we're going strong into next into the um, the end of the quarter. So tomorrow, Thursday, November 11th, Eric Garcia, who's a journalist and author of We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation, and former IOP Pritzker fellow, Tim Alberta, who's a staff writer for The Atlantic, will be joining us to discuss the research and misperceptions surrounding autism and other disabilities, along with um, the craft of writing and their journalism careers. On Monday, November 15th, we have two events. So at 10.30 in the morning, please join us for a live taping of the Axe Files with uh, David Axelrod in conversation with Representative Pramila Jayapal, who, as you all know, is the chair of the House Progressive Caucus. Um, at 5.30 that same day, um, on Monday, I'll be moderating a discussion with Huma Abedin, who's a top aide and longtime advisor to Hillary Clinton. Um, and she'll be joining us to discuss her career in national politics and her new memoir, Both and A Life in Many Worlds. After the moderated discussion, we'll open the floor to take questions from you all in the audience. Please line up to ask your questions. And um, as usual, we'll give priority first to student questions. Um, please make sure your phones are on silent. And we will now hear formal introductions of our speakers from Adam Zabner. Adam is a fourth year neuroscience major from Iowa City, Iowa. Through the IOP's Iowa project, Adam worked as an organizer for Pete Buttigieg's 2020 caucus campaign, after which he became the regional organizing di director for Northwest Iowa and the 2020 Iowa Democratic Party coordinated campaign. It's a mouthful. After the 2020 election, Adam worked on John Ossoff's runoff campaign in Georgia for the US Senate. Please join me in welcoming Adam to the podium. Hi. It's an honor to introduce the speakers for today's event, titled Speaker McCarthy Looking Ahead to the 2022 Midterms. Today's speakers are two of the most successful pollsters in the country and have helped presidents navigate a moment of upheaval, both in the electorate and in the way that polling is conducted. Tony Fabrizio is an IOP fellow and served as the chief pollster for President Donald Trump's campaigns in 2016 and 2020. This quarter, he has been leading a seminar series teaching students about the state of the Republican Party and the trends in today's electorate. He has also worked internationally for candidates like Marine Le Pen and Bibi Netanyahu, and also with corporate clients. Jan John Anzalone, who was a field organizer in Iowa for Joe Biden's 1988 campaign, is now the chief pollster for President Joe Biden, proving my theory that organizers run the world. He also pulled for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, along with numerous candidates for Senate, Governor, and Congress. He has done work with corporations, nonprofits, advocacy groups, and trade associations. Today's conversation will be moderated by IOP advisory board member and former fellow Karen Tumulty. She is deputy editorial page editor and columnist for the Washington Post. She recently re released a book on First Lady Nancy Reagan titled The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. Please join me in welcoming today's speakers. Thank you so much, Adam. And after hearing your experience, I'm halfway thinking we ought to invite you to just pull a chair on the stage. <laughs> uh, I'm so delighted to be here tonight. And thank you so much for coming out. Um, this place is so special to me. And um, of course, as a political reporter, there's nothing you enjoy more than talking to people who are doing it and who are really at the top of their game, which is why we are doubly lucky tonight. Um, and the timing of this event was sheer perfection. For some people. <laughs> I have no complaints. <laughs> So uh, before, we're looking ahead tonight, but we can't look ahead without looking back a week. Um, I think that as Election Day was rolling around, it was possible to anticipate what was going to happen in Virginia. 
Uh, if either of you tells me you expected how close it was in New Jersey, I'm going to make you prove it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there was also just across the map from local elections in Long Island to local elections in Seattle and Minneapolis. So Anzo, what do you take away from the, all of this? Well, I mean, the big takeaway is that Democrats got their ass kicked. I mean, that, right? I mean, in, in we should like, you know, I always say when you go through a big beating, the first thing is don't deny it, right? I mean, you have to like own it and say DEFCON 10 and, you know, understand that you have to figure out why. Um, I think that, you know, we talked about this last night. A lot of this is atmospheric. These guys talked about it yeah. last night. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it, listen, is atmospherics, right? I mean, we are in a bad political environment. We're in a bad economic environment. And we're still in, in the 20 month of a pandemic. That's not excuses for what happened, but understand that if you go back in time and you Google midterm elections, right, or these off-year elections, you're going to see the same thing happen to Carter. You're going to see the same thing happen to, to Reagan, Obama. Obama, you know, Bush, et cetera, uh, and Trump, Trump, right, in 18. Seven, so, I mean, most of them are economic. Um, some of them, like uh, W. Bush, was more about the Iraq war. For um, uh, Trump, it was more about this kind of distaste that you know su uh, suburban women had for him once he became president. But the fact is, is that historically, this is not unusual. The difference is, is that, again, whether you believe it or not, is that President Joe Biden, in modern history, has had more challenges than just about any other president's had. We're in the 20th uh, uh, month of a pandemic. Psychologically, there was always anxiety about it happening again. And guess what? It happened again with Delta. You have supply chain problems. You have inflation because of pent up demand and supply chain. You have work shortages. You had Afghanistan. You had the Haitian border. I mean, you can go on and on. And we went through two and a half months of literally slog of the process of trying to get something done, which was really bad. Because if you're talking process, you're losing. So the atmospherics were really, really bad. And you can talk about what percentage is atmospherics and bad political and economic environment versus you know, whether Terry McAuliffe owned 30 or 40% of his loss, but you can't avoid New Jersey. No. You can't avoid some of these other places where, again, the political environment and economic environment, and again, psychologically, the pandemic environment of fatigue um, just is going to hurt the person who's president of the United States or the party. So this it's a Democrat is just or Republican. the environment? This isn't any mistake so this the is Democrats the, the are second making part, The second part of it is don't misdiagnose. So you have to make sure that, again, you don't misdiagnose whether or not, oh, is this just a messaging problem, et cetera. And maybe we can talk about messaging a little later on in it, yeah. because I think that Democrats actually have the potential and the tools and the toolkit for 2022 but there's only one silver lining about the elections in 2021, and that is it's not 2022. And so we have one year to figure out and diagnose uh, and talk about what the way is or the path forward. Because usually the path forward when you're in a situation is not to get your ass kicked again, it's to have just a not so bad night. <laughs> there's a big difference between that and be competitive. And I think that there, I think that we can be competitive, and I'll outline that, but maybe you know, uh, Tony wants to talk about some of the other things as well. Uh, well, uh, first rule, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Yeah. And uh, that's something that the Democrats have to learn, but it's not only the Democrats. We fall to the same problem when it happens to us, oftentimes. Um, and, and Karen, I will challenge you on New Jersey. I did. You've got proof. You got it right. I, I, I released a survey in early September that had uh, Cittarelli losing by one to Murphy. Wow. And uh, not only that, but there was private polling internal to the campaign that had the race within two or three the whole last two months. And you talk about what happened on Long Island. Uh, I'm from there, and I was deeply involved in knocking off a Democrat incumbent DA and taking back a county legislature that they hadn't had for 12 years. So it's hard to look at the results and not understand that what happened, and we saw it happening early on to, to get into the weeds a little bit, was there was an increased... Uh, an increased surge, if you will, 
uh, among Republican voters. But the bigger thing was is that we saw uh, a collapse of President Biden's numbers with independents. Right. And that was really uh, the turning point in a number of these races. When we were looking at New Jersey or Virginia, and we saw Biden's numbers go from being plus five or plus six with independents to being down 10, that shift really sh shook the foundations of how those elections were going to go. Um, I think one of the problems that both parties suffer from is they misread what happened in the previous election. Right and they overplay their hand. They think when they got elected, it was a massive mandate to do certain things. And I disagree with John, and I told him that we'll, we'll be nice to each other tonight. Um, I disagree with him in that while I, I do think that anything is possible in politics, I think it is going to be even more difficult now for the Democrats to break out of their funk of the fighting between the more moderate members from marginal districts and the progressives because, and, and, and I understand they passed the infrastructure bill, but the next piece is even tougher. Uh, and I think that next piece is, could very well be even more problematic for them because it's not just what people think of the bill overall, it's, and there is some data that's come out lately that's shown this, that people have mixed opinions about whether or not that next spending bill is actually going to help them or hurt them. And if it flips to the hurt side, and it flips to the hurt side big, you know, I, we've kind of seen this, you know, when they told the Democrats in 2009, pass Obamacare, and in 2010, we'll be giving all this stuff away, and that didn't kind of work. So but, but here's the big difference. Different. But here's the big difference. The fact is, is that in 2009, um, the last, you know, in 10, we got our butts kicked too. In 2009, immediately, ACA, Obamacare, was underwater. Net negative in approval rating. Bad. And it only got worse. Because then you re remember, when it went online, it crashed. And so there was an incompetence problem too. The fact is, during the entire debate of building back together, or whatever you want to call it, um, the numbers have never moved. Not only is it 60% in terms of approval rating, all the individual components have way above 60% approval. So we talk about the third part of when you have this type of election, don't despair, but do something, right? You have to have a message. And that's why I don't wanna misdiagnose, right? Because we'll have the ultra left in our party wanting to say, well, if you would have just been more liberal and more progressive, and if you would have just defunded police, and if you would have been, been more woke, et cetera, et cetera, it would have all worked out right. Well, the fact is this. When I talk about the toolkit, we have, and we're about, and again, the two and a half months has been brutal. The process is brutal. People expected us to get something done and we didn't get it done. We'll get it done. And at that point in time, we're gonna have something that we can talk about in the 2022 elections that are impactful for people. And by the way, none of this is stuff that people think is social spending or you know entitlements, et cetera. It's stuff that they think is gonna help them. It's going to lower insurance premiums. It's going to lower the cost of prescription drugs. It's going to help them with child care. It's going to help them with elder care, which is huge. In some sectors, it's going to help people with But they're um, not going housing. to feel it by Hold November on. Let, me, let me just tell you. But once you, you know, we're going to spend, there's going to be $7 billion spent in the midterm elections. By the time we're, what my point is, is that we are going to be able to communicate about what we've done. But more importantly, we're going to be able to communicate because not one Republican is going to vote for any of that. So every frontline Democrat who's out there or, or Senate, candidate for Senate is going to be able to say, the Republicans voted against lowering costs for health care premiums, voted against lowering the cost of, uh, health, uh, of, of prescription drugs, elderly care, da 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 Why? To protect those at the top in big corporations. The fact is, is that we have a message. And I think we will have a very strong message because the one misdiagnosis is that somehow people are loving Republicans. The fact is you always default to the party that's not in charge. The Republican Party has worse numbers than the Democratic Party, and their leaders have worse numbers than Joe Biden. Now, we're getting our butt kicked because of the, the atmospherics. I get it, and maybe miscues on certain things that happen in each state. But we shouldn't get in disarray, and we shouldn't forget the fact that we have a really potential 
strong message in 2022. But, but right, I, 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 do I get my rebuttal? Yes, okay. absolutely. But I was rebuttaling to you. What do you call it? Is no. it a rebuttal? Do you want a rebuttal? This is this is a re rebuttal. Rebuttal. Okay. This is this. All right. So uh, while I, look, I do not doubt that somewhere at the White House there is this long list of beautiful things that you're going to tell the voters about what this plan does and what this plan doesn't do. The problem is, is that the seeds of doubt have already been planted. And not only have the seeds of doubt already been planted, but as I said, we've got a problem that's called inflation. And while you may understand it to be a supply chain problem, the average person doesn't care about supply chain. I agree. They care about what happens when they go to their grocery store to buy a turkey, what happens when they go to get gas, what happens with all of these things, housing prices just exploding through the roof. And so the real question is going to become, can you make a credible, what is easier to do? To make the argument that all of this government spending is only fueling the inflation and the inflationary spiral that we're in? or we need to spend our way out of inflation. And let's let's say today right. we had in, we mm -hmm. had inflation numbers 6.2%. It's 30 one years. month right. but it is the worst in 30, 30 years. years. Uh, and people are and are already arguing that to drop a gigantic load of government spending into the middle of this environment and even, you know, especially since there are people sure. on the Hill arguing we shouldn't even bother with the CBO score, right. uh, how are you going to fight that? Three things. First of all, you notice that he did a head fake. He didn't respond to the strong message that the Democrats have, and he didn't respond to that we're going to kick Republicans' asses because they're going to vote for <coughs> all this stuff that is impactful for working families. That, uh, I mean, you went, we, you, you curveball no, 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 to inflation. No, 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 you no, curveball no, no, no. to inflation, Because Tony. that's what voters care no. about. Say voters care about, care, about in, very care about inflation today in November, in November of 2021. Here's the thing that they always hope for, is that the political and, and economic environment stays the same. But if we came back here, if you invite us back here in September or October of 2022, who thinks the economic and political environment is going to be the same? That, that's the thing. Now, I'm not counting on that, right? But the fact is, is that I will take our message of what we are going to do for people that's going to be real and what they didn't do for people and why they didn't do it over this hypothetical that inflation is going to be as bad in October of 2022. Now, listen, I don't know it. Inflation's real. No head in the sand. I mean, the fact is that the psychological impact of inflation is the driver of people's perception of the economy. That's real. I understand that. And every day, you know, the Biden administration is trying to do things on supply chain and ports and all that type of stuff. And I think we would probably both agree that a lot of it has to work itself out within, you know, the, the, the business and economic it cycle. Does. It does. You bought it. You, you, we, we, you pay, bought we, it. we pay for it. Okay. Right. So We're paying for you know, Donald Trump's $6.7 trillion worth of spending in his uh, administration. Uh, uh, that was, his, that was my curveball, <laughs> right? I mean, that's my, uh, that was can my I, third let point. Me, uh, let that me was take, my uh, third uh, point. Can I take this back? Um, okay. You better get control of yes, this, Karen. exactly. <laughs> so there were a couple of things that also, okay, one is the assumption among Democrats has been, and I think it was shattered in Virginia, that high turnout right. benefits the Democrats. That I think Wrong. is gone. The second assumption is, you know, political scientists love to argue that candidate quality doesn't matter. I think Glenn Youngkin oh. disproved that. But how your client in chief right. is going to want to be intervening in a lot of primaries, he stayed away from Virginia. But he's going to, there's a lot of score settling going on with Trump. How worried are you about primaries that produce the kind of some of the offbeat candidates that we've seen? Offbeat? <laughs> I'm that? looking for a nice word. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think that one, uh, first, you, you, we can't dispute that. Uh, Donald Trump is still a major force inside the Republican Party. You can't dispute that. 
He's sitting there with 150 plus million dollars in his in his accounts. And a lot of scores against Republicans. And, and, he and, wants to and sell. he does, including Mitch McConnell. McConnell. And he does. Um, which, interestingly enough, Mitch McConnell came around and endorsed Herschel Walker today. Yeah. After basically trying to sabotage him uh, through his minions uh, before he got into the race. So it's interesting to see McConnell basically bow to what uh, Trump wants. Um, there's no question that he's going to make endorsements, um, and some of those endorsements are not going to pan out. And it's going to be a situation where um, we're not going to always nominate the best person. It's not going to be like 2014 where it was a much more controlled process because after 2010, if you remember, with the Tea Party, you know, the party leadership went about trying to control that process. But After I am not a witch. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, after I am not a witch, right. Um, but I do think what is going to happen is I think we have so many competitive races that the playing field is such that if we don't get the right candidate or what is perceived to be the right candidate in a race or two, the options for us to still take back the House and take back the Senate are plentiful. And it's not going to be every place where he plays, and it's not going to be every place where he picks somebody that is, you know, unelectable. For example, you talk John's home state, Alabama, okay? Mo Brooks, the president, former president, has endorsed Mo Brooks. Can Mo Brooks win statewide in Alabama? Yes, Mo Brooks can win statewide in Alabama. Okay? Right, but can Ted, Ted Bond win in North Carolina? Right. I mean, that, I mean, that's that's the reality of, of what what this is all about. 2010. I don't know. I mean, a lot. Tom Tillis uh, was dead in North Carolina. Right, right, he right, wasn't right. Dead in yeah. North Carolina. But the point. Well, but, I mean, let's face it. There was some situational right. stuff so, going so, on in North Carolina, including and there right. a nominee who too. had some unfortunate. The, the most, might be this the most entertaining season of 2022 isn't going to be baseball, football, basketball. It's going to be the Republican primaries, because in 2010, which he was uh, alluding to. We got Sharon Angle against um, uh, Harry Reid, and Harry Reid should have lost, and we won. We got the witch, Christine O'Donnell in Delaware, who, you know, Chris. She was Reed, not a witch. Right, hold on. <laughs> Rick, Rick, you know, right, uh, right. you know, uh, Murdoch in, uh, in, 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 in uh, right. Indiana and, but and we Aiken. still but, won the House and took over well, the majority fine, of the governor. The point, so. the point is, is that you should have taken it over that year, and you didn't. Well. And these things do, like candidates do matter. I mean, they there's do. no doubt about it. They do. And, the fact is, is that the Democrats are probably going to have some competitive races that they shouldn't have because of that. that. And it puts us in a more competitive state. But I also want to go to your original question about Virginia. Because I do think that when you get your butt beat, there should be lessons learned, right? You asked that. And the fact is, is that in 2017, we had historic off-year election turnout everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you were in the mayor of Cincinnati, we had double the, the turnout because people were so pissed off about what they saw in Trump. They thought, oh, we're going to give this guy a try. And then he turned out not to be, you know, who he was or what they thought. They thought he was going to be presidential. I mean, we saw this in focus groups. Women were particularly disgusted with him and you saw what happened, right? And so you never could have imagined that there was going to be bigger turnout than 17 in Virginia where Northam won in 21 and we were everyone and was there wrong. was and there was and so you learn that you have to persuade because what tony was talking about with independent voters in 2006 to give you an example we won in democrats won independent voters 60 40. guess what in 2010 republicans won, won at 60 40. you there is still a middle out there and you have to persuade them because even though terry mcauliffe got 200,000 more votes than northrum the the, the previous guy who won there was something like 600,000 more people who came out. 26% bigger turnout than 17, which was a historic turnout. You, you, you can't out-mobilize but, but, the, the organization. That's my point. No, no, no. But you also, yes, but you also have to look at what the turnout was. <laughs> and candidate quality does matter. But I would, I would argue that um, while all the attention was on Youngkin, and I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, belittling the campaign that Youngkin ran. They ran a, a very campaign. good campaign, and McAuliffe ran a crappy campaign, particularly the last three weeks. He never offered a reason why he should be governor again, and he was the functional incumbent, having he served in that, right, you know, in that role before. But if you look at the turnout, according to the exit polls, and John and I both have our private feelings about exit polls, uh, but if you look at the exit polls, the turnout in Virginia was 
whiter, less college educated, older, less conservative, and less Democrat considerably across the board than it was in 2017. So it wasn't just the flip of independence that made the difference. It was who it turned was, out. It was who turned out. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that even though more Democrats turned out, there was considerably like more, more Republicans right. that turned out. And, and that, in 2018, one of the things we saw in our polling, and I'm sure John saw it as well, we were doing a bunch of work for CLF, Congressional Leadership Fund. Probably did 35, 40 districts for them in that year, uh, where we took a bloodbath. And one of the things that we noticed... C CLF, let's explain. Congressional Leadership Fund. But it is, is, the, it was, is the super PAC that's associated with the House, House Republican, Republican leadership. leadership. And at the time, Ryan was the speaker, and it was his basic super... It was basically his super PAC. And one of the things we do when we do our polling, not to get too deep into the weeds, is we do it among known registered voters. So we know your vote history. When you take that survey, we know whether you voted or not. And one of the things that consistently came coming back is that there was anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of the sample, not of the entire elector, but of the sample that screened in, that had never voted in a midterm election before that said they were voting. When you look at typical midterm voters, Republicans were winning them by a point or two, generally. When you looked at that 20 to 30 percent, Democrats were winning them by double digits. And in a lot of these districts, that made the difference that flipped. And the opposite happened in 17. That's right. The question is now, what happens in 2022, where I will tell you, say what you want about Donald Trump, and I know everybody in this room has an opinion of Donald Trump. He Some of you many of He brings people out, them. man. Yes, yeah, right. He brings people out. He does. He, there's a lot of two-edged sword with him. But one of the things he does is every election that he has been on the national stage for, turnout has increased and continues to increase. And so, you know, everybody in Virginia, you had a, a, a 600,000 vote increase. In New Jersey, they had almost a 500,000 vote <laughs> increase, and it wasn't even as focused on as it was in Virginia. So, and, and can we just, I think, to connect the dots in Virginia, Terry McAuliffe's entire campaign was trying to paint Youngkin, Glenn Youngkin, as a Trumpite. The problem is, at the end of the day, 20% of the people who voted for Youngkin had a disapproval of Trump. of Trump. Why? I've been watching a bunch of focus groups of Biden Youngkin voters because they said, well, this guy is a guy who you'd see yeah. on a Saturday at a soccer game. Yep. He wasn't Trump. Yep. Okay, so you're, you're thinking you're going to have a set of accomplishments to sell. But how are Democrats going to play defense on some of the issues that we saw in Virginia? Yeah. You critical race theory has become, you know, sure. it's a code phrase. And yes, we can talk about it's not in the curriculum for third graders in Virginia, but it struck a resonance. McAuliffe didn't seem to right. understand. Well, I mean, How I are you going to defend? But that's I think not the only thing. It wasn't. Like, the border uh, and immigration. Yeah, and all, immigration right, right. and all of these. The, two, two things. We know the playbook. Let's, Understood. How are you going to defend? We, under, you know, we, got, we got things that we want to do for people, and they use wedge issues. And you know what? Wedge issues sometimes wins over impactful things for people. Wins a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the playbook is Joe Biden for president 2020, right? They hit us on defunding police. Joe Biden said, I, I don't, you know, I don't believe in defunding police. We're going to actually, act, he actually had a plan to increase funding for police. They said, you're going to raise taxes. No, not true. It's a lie. I'm only going to raise taxes on people over $400,000. You know, I, every time you got to knock it down. Now, the problem in Virginia wasn't just critical race theory. It was that the candidate himself in a debate said, I don't think that parents should have a say Bingo. in what teachers teach. That was a problem. That is a value statement. You lost yep. people there. Men, women, everyone, right? Rural, you know, Democrats, independents, et cetera. That was a big problem. But critical race theory? I mean, I think that if you're smart, you don't say, well, critical race theory isn't taught anywhere in public schools. No, I'm against critical race theory. And then you explain the importance of teaching things like slavery and civil rights and lynching, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, but if how, you want to- How do you, you deal want, with the left of your you own party to, on that then? Hey, man, you know, how did Joe Biden deal with the left? The fact is that he disagreed on defunding 
He disagreed on fracking. He disagreed on a lot of things with the left. But the fact is, he became president of the United States. And, wow. you know, there's going, to be di there's going to be disagreements. But if, if you're a frontline Democrat, you know, you're, you're going to have to take I some stands that maybe you're going to take some heat for. I, w I would argue, my dear friend and colleague. Well, you're, gonna, you're, you're giving advice for Democrats? I'm, I'm going to give, uh, and then I'm going to send the bill over to DNC right. headquarters. Uh, I, I, I would argue that the divisions in the Democratic Party during the 2020 election and during the 2020 primary process to nominate Joe Biden were covered or papered over because of, because of, let me finish, because there was one thing that united Democrats more than anything else. Donald Trump. Their absolute hate and just loathing of Donald Trump. So while, you know, AOC and, I don't know, uh, the congressman from New Jersey, the, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, uh, that uh, God moderate God, God guy, Godhammer, may not agree on anything, they do agree that Donald Trump should not be president. So I think a lot of it was kind of papered over, but now what's happened that you guys have to actually govern, and what's happening is, I thought President Biden made one of the truest statements in the world when he said, when you have a 50-50 Senate, every senator is a president. <laughs> it was, I thought it's it was, true. I thought it was it's so true. funny and it was so yeah. accurate. But the problem you have is, the AOCs of the world are not going away. They're not going anywhere. Well, neither and, are the Joe Manchins. Right, well, but then that creates a problem for how you get all these things you want to get passed done. And, you know, it's, and, and how you get right. Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema to go along with it. Or how do you get, you're not going to get the 13 Listen, Republicans. That are gonna we all live in, we got to live in reality. Okay, the Democratic caucus is not like the Republican caucus. The Democratic caucus does not look like a country club board of directors. Oh, right? trust I, me, I mean, like, I would caucus say does the not look like a country club. club. I'm just saying, <laughs> the, the fact is that we have an incredibly diverse, ideologically, demographically, gender, et cetera, religiously, et cetera. And you know, the fact is, the process is pretty damn messy, and it has hurt us. I'll be the first one to, to, to say that. But we're going to get some really important stuff done. And getting stuff done is important. It's going to be really impactful stuff as well. You're going to have to deal with that, not now, oh. not in the first quarter or the second quarter, but come the third and fourth quarter of the well, year, you guys are going to have to deal I, with I the fact you that you don't have anything to run I on. hope you guys have plans for what you're going to do about the border and what you're going to do about how we're perceived abroad, or about what you're going to do about how voters have lost confidence in Biden's ability to govern, not his ability to understand government, but the perception that Biden may not be up to the job of governing, or that the party, your party, while they may not like our party, what's happened over the last few months hasn't certainly helped the image of the Democratic Party. It certainly has not. So, I mean, let's, let's, you know. No, listen, challenge, 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 challenge. I don't disagree with yeah, any of that. Yeah. But the fact is where I think you guys are going to get all overconfident, hyperconfident, is the fact that this is a done deal. I'll oh, take that any day. I never doubt our ability I, to pull the right. feet and out I of will, the jaws I of will take that every day. But, but, but the thing is, one other thing that you said. I never doubt. The fact that Joe Biden ran against literally 13 other liberals made him stronger and the fact is is that moderates or basic or, or pragmatic moderates to pragmatic liberals still dominate the democratic party and the fact is is that what happens in dc in the bubble is not real america oh i agree and if with as you a 100%. party we only kowtow to that side of it and then we're we're, we're going to have Tony, we're going to have some I'd, real problems i'd also like to sort of come sure. over to your party here sure. because please, please. <laughs> okay <laughs> So, so you want to join? You want, no. to join, you want to join the Republican Party? So, That'd be big news tomorrow. But you, <laughs> so, okay, the Republican Party is now in a position where I think Jim Jordan's in the mainstream. Donald Trump has convinced most Republicans that the election was massive fraud, that he was actually elected, which is a lie. Um, he, did, he did convince them. He has convinced them. He has convinced them of that, but it is not in keeping with reality. 
So we're going to go into this next election with a lot of people really doubting the integrity of whatever the results are. Well, I think uh, unless one, a Republican wins, unless a Republican, well, 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 like but, Young, but 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 you know, I would I would love to agree with your statement that that's going to impact the turnout. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that we saw turnout, particularly Republican turnout, in both New Jersey and Virginia increase by more than Democrats. I'm not even thinking about how it impacts turnout. I'm thinking how it impacts democracy. How it impacts, if we can't, if we have reached the point where a significant portion of our population doesn't trust the people who have run our elections and done a pretty good job of it for our, you know, most of our history. Uh, I, I think there's, first of all, I think there's, a, I don't want to parse this, but I think there's a gradation of what people think, okay? And I think even within the Republican Party, there's a gradation of what they think. And we've surveyed this, and I presented them in my seminars about what Republicans thought about the election. Um, but the closer we get to 22, and the prospect of having electoral successes, having the electoral success we did in Virginia, having the close call that we did in New Jersey, I think actually helps move this down the road. Now, will President Trump stop talking about it? I don't know. I, I don't I have do. a crystal ball. He's not going to stop yeah, talking I, okay, about well, it. Well, but at some point, once you get past 2022, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's you're now on to the next election. So can know? I do another lesson of the 2021 elections, mm -hmm. which kind of goes to this, is that big turnout, Republicans shouldn't fear big turnout, which means what? They shouldn't fear making it as easy as possible for people to friggin' vote. The fact is, is that because Virginia was blue, meaning that there was a, a Democratic governor and Democratic le legislature, mail-in voting was easy, uh, early voting and early voting places, early voting times, et cetera. You shouldn't be afraid of it. The fact is, is that in New Jersey and Virginia, if you do it in Georgia and all these other places, that you're so worried that you're stopping people, you know, putting impediments for people to vote, whether it's by mail or for by, by early voting, you really have no worry about uh, it. Be you you really have not, no worry about we're it. Not, we're not. And listen. You're man. impeding. If you're, if, you're, <laughs> if, you're, if you're limiting the number of early voting uh, places in a place like North Carolina, where I do the governor, there was a lot of them. Now there's a few of them. If you're not going to let the mail-in boxes, if you're going to limit the number of days, if you're going to limit the number of hours for early vote, that is an impediment for people. But you're making but, an argument here. We know what is actually happening. And how do the Democrats have a strategy for anywhere there's a close election that the Democrat comes out ahead, you're going to have swarms of people looking we've for always bamboo had fiber. No, no, no. Listen, we've always had, listen, both sides have always we, done a we, great we job have, too. of having, you know, election uh, people there watching, you know, and immediately there's, you know, a broken machine, you call it, all that type of stuff happens. EDO. Like and people don't trust the, that. The, the, well, I mean, Republicans I mean, don't trust that it, anymore. I, I, can't, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. Like, I don't know how to answer how they act I, I, and what they're trying to do to put not only impediments on voting, but really impediments on the election. Were there profile encouraged Republicans out there? Yes. The Secretary of State in Georgia is a guy who deserves a lot of accolades about how he stood up to Trump. There's videotape of it, right? There's probably going to be lawsuits about it. There were 60 different uh, judges who ruled against the Trump organization about the legitimacy of the election. I don't think there was one that didn't. So, you know, the fact is, is that that's going to, at the end of the day, rule how, it, how uh, the outcome. I, I would just make the following observation. In states where there had already been uh, a number of states, I don't know if you know this, uh, but a number of states already had robust mail ballot programs for years. Okay. Florida. Florida for one of them. Arizona, Ohio, Colorado is all vote by mail. I mean, there are certain states that are all vote by mail at all. They just mail everybody ballots. I think the thing that helped prod along the whole theory, if you will, of what happened was there were a number of states where this was not used to being done 
and it was being done under the guise of COVID and because people didn't want to vote. And one of the things that happened was by President Trump attacking mail voting before it ever happened, it polarized who would vote by mail. And it pushed Republicans from being mail-in voters in these other states or early voters to being election day voters and Democrats to being mail-in voters and early voters. And one of the things that we saw, and I'm sure you saw it as well as I did in our surveys, was it was very easy to see how on election night there would be a red mirage where it would look mm -hmm. like, you know, because you'd build up on the election day votes such a huge margin, but you knew that there was still a couple of million mail-in ballots that were going to be counted, and they were going to break two to one, sometimes three to one for the Democrat because of the people who voted. We saw consistently that Democrats were more fearful of COVID than Republicans, and they were more fearful of voting in, in person than Republicans were. So that's a unique set of circumstances that hopefully we never have to face again, where we don't have people unsure about how the mail-in ballots work or unknowing that there were three million mail-in ballots that were cast. More and more people will take advantage of that as time goes on. And hopefully we move forward. Well, but the problem is, is that in a place like Georgia, where it worked beautifully, except for the fact that Biden won it and two Democratic senators won it, won, the Republican legislature and the Republican governor decided, okay, you know, it worked beautifully, but let's put impediments on it. Let's make sure that, I, you know, all these different things. Oh, you got to have a notary public, or you got to, you know, fax in this, or you got to have this. You have all these different things. You're changing the rules on what worked. That's what's happening. If, if what you mean by requiring people to show ID. We are, we're for ID. That, Don't no, do that. Stacey, you guys are not Stacey for Abrams, ID. Stacey That's Abrams, not true. Stacey Abrams oh, in please Georgia do not has quote. said... Quoting I am Stacey for Abrams to don't, me. But don't hide behind <laughs> ID. We're for, most people are for an no, ID. Yes, most people are for right. ID. But the Democratic is, Party is not, not for ID. That's not the new, new rules that's going to the, change the rules in Georgia. I mean, there's like 15 or 20 different new rules, including by, heaven forbid, someone give someone a bottle of water while they stand, stand in line. Well, come on, you should okay. die of thirst while you're <laughs> trying to vote. Okay, right. wait, wait, reclaiming my time. All right. Um, one last question. Thank you for joining us, Kathy. <laughs> One last question before we go to your questions, which we are very much looking forward to. What about the, the perception of Biden articulated this week by Abigail Smanberger, that he, that this Biden, that this <clears throat> gigantic, massive program that the Democrats are trying to get through on Capitol Hill is not what Biden was elected to do. As she said, we didn't think we were, okay. people didn't think they yeah. were electing FDR. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a great question, except for 90% of Joe Biden's TV ads, digital ads and mail, outlined his Build Back Better program, and we outlined all of it, including a much bigger price tag and how we were gonna pay for it, so it wasn't gonna raise the national debt. So I love her, she's great, and she's reacting to, you know, her governor or her candidate getting uh, beat in Virginia. But the fact is, is that Joe Biden did one singular thing, two singular, two, two, two things uh, in the election. He said he's going to get a control of COVID, right, get a handle on it. And the second is he laid out everything that is in reconciliation or build back together, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we did hundreds of millions of dollars worth of TV. Voters knew exactly what he was, what he, matter of fact, voters he told us, he, voters he, told us what he, what, that they wanted to know what he was going to do, and he laid out exactly what he was going to do, and guess what? He's going to get part of it passed. So, Tony, has he been dragged to the left by his party? Oh, absolutely. A. B. You know, uh, with all due respect, my friend. Okay, but uh, well, I, I, with all due respect, my friend, we're, you know, we talk about this seven million vote margin that Joe Biden had, when in fact, we elect presidents by the electoral college. And in the he electoral won that college, too. yes, he did, he did. Just but for the want of 47,000 votes, the electoral college would have looked much differently. So my point being is to say that those states were decided based on his future Build Back Better plan. It was. When, in fact, 
arguably, and not only arguably, you look at the exit poll data, you can see that coronavirus, COVID, had a much bigger impact in those states that flipped than the states that didn't flip is to, is to misread whoa, whoa, whoa. it. Hold on. There's no, listen, is part of the reason Joe Biden is president because your guy failed in his job on coronavirus? Absolutely. Let, let's like I'll lay will that, that down be there. the same will that be the but, same excuse why you guys lose no, 2022 because no. he failed but, to get it under question, control the question was about <laughs> Abigail and I think it's absolutely unfair to say that voters didn't know what Joe Biden would want to do when 90 percent of our ads was laying out his build back better program and the fact is is that you can ask oh is Joe Biden getting more liberal people talk about social spending stuff like that if you're a working family right and you're getting and your insurance premiums um, cut or prescription drugs cut or some help with some child care or elder care, allow me to suggest none of those working families think that that's liberal policy. None of those families think that it's entitlement. None of those families think it's handout. What they think is, is that they've been working their asses off and they have not been able to get any benefit from the economy. That's what they felt pre-pandemic. And now that they, I, I believe, they're going to feel that they have an opportunity to succeed in this economy because of, because of these type of things. And the fact is, is that, you know, we can knock them down to save because of the political and economic environment now, but these are real things that will help people. Will it save us in 2022? I don't know, Tony. I really don't know. But the fact is, is that it was laid out in his campaign, and I think it's, it's a miscue by uh, her to say that. Okay, can, and yeah. I'll give you your rebuttal, no, no, but no. I also just want to point out, we have a microphone set up uh, right there, and so if you guys have better questions than I do, please line up. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Tony. I don't. This is a lot of people lining up. I, I, figured, I figured this is what we were going to see. Uh-huh. Well, uh, well I, I, I think um, only time will tell. What's right. going to happen in 2020? Oh, what right? a wimp out! No, here. but it, I, look, I've already said what I believe. I don't think I don't think any of this is really going to help them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think this that you're going to be able to describe all of these things that you're going to do, and it's going to make people. I mean, you just look at the trends and what's happened. You know, white non-college educated voters continue to move to the Republican Party. Those are the voters that you're trying to target to get back. And what's happening is there's a values fight going on that critical race theory may engender, but it's broader than that. And people think that mask mandates and vaccine mandates are all about, you know, whether I want to wear a mask or not. What's happened is there's been a revolt about you telling me what I can and cannot do. And it's that type of values type of fight that is going to be the underlying problem that you guys face in 2022, not some academic arguing about it's not whether or not I put five argument. dollars more it, in your pocket. I agree with the psychological <laughs> fatigue that people have. I agree with all of that. That is that is benefiting you, even though it has nothing really to do with us. Right. Well, <laughs> you know. But the but the point is is that if you're if you're counting on that to still be there, you know, uh, in but when the bell rings in you September. You guys will make okay. it there. Okay, can we okay, we'll move on to the questions. Can I just ask a couple of things? One is Please identify yourself and so that we can get through as many questions as possible. Please put your question in the form of a question. Hey, good evening. Thanks for coming. Alex, University of Chicago, Booth School of Business. As a dissatisfied, moderate, self-identified, moderate, independent, dissatisfied Biden voter who feels like he caved to the left. And I don't know, I didn't know much about what Joe Biden stood for and polling data seems to be like, how do you answer? All the point data I've seen is people don't know what's in the Build Back Better program. They don't know what it's for, what it is, and how do you think like people actually like something they don't know about? Yeah, you've hit, that is a challenge, brother. I mean, like, you've hit it on the head. The fact is, is that when you go through this process and you're just counting on, quite frankly, free press, uh, it's really difficult. And quite frankly, that's what campaigns are about, right? I mean, at the, end, at the beginning of when Joe Biden started his presidential campaign, no one know, knew what, why, what he wanted to do when he was president, right? and we spent a couple hundred million dollars. The fact is, is that whether we like it or not, is there gonna be like six or seven billion dollars spent on campaigns in, in one year, right? And that is incumbent upon a Democrat or a Republican 
to get their message out and to explain that very thing, which is here's what's in that bill, here's what we've done for you, and here's how it's going to impact you. That is the absolute challenge. You've hit it on the head right there. Nothing easy about it okay. either, by the way. Hi, Annie Henderson from the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, so we have a, new, a unique year coming up, not just because you both are here together speaking to us, but because of redistricting. Oof. And so I'm curious, how does redistricting play He's into smiling. your thinking? He's smiling. He's smiling. So I'll let it. Be, Tony. <laughs> this is good for him. I, I, I uh, you know, every state is going through their process. We've seen a bunch of states that have finalized. Other states are putting out multiple maps. At the end of the day, uh, I think we wind up picking up seats just through redistricting. Yes. And just through redistricting, not like counting how, what we pick single up. Single digit, double digit. Um, count, I, I mean. think, I think probably single digit because there are still Democrat states could, like New it York. It could be double. Digit. It could be, but I think there are still some Democrat states like New York that are still, you know, they could move it around where you can basically off a couple of Republicans in the districts, depending on how you do it. But we don't. You're in need, Illinois. Yeah. yeah, right. We don't need. Uh, we really don't Four. need more than 10 seats just from redistricting to gain control again. So yeah. I think that's, I think that bodes well for us. It's, look, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're in a sailboat and either you have a stiff wind at your back or you don't. And redistricting is certainly one of the pieces of that yeah. stiff wind we have heading into 2020. Republicans do three, th three things really well, right? They do redistricting. Beat Democrats. <laughs> they do, re yeah, 2018 and 20. They do redistricting. <laughs> <laughs> 2010, 2014. <laughs> um, they do redistricting really well. I mean, really, really well. I think in North Carolina, they potentially that map could go from nine Republicans to 13 or something like that, or 11. Anyway, look it up. They do do redistricting really well. Um, uh, they they do disinformation really, really well. I mean, like. <laughs> What? And what? then they do brand. Oh, they, and then the crowds never do this. And the third thing they do really well, and I have to admit it, is they do branding. They brand the Democrats really well. I mean, they just do a better job and, than how we brand them. And, uh, even when and it you hurts see, us. But even when you see reforms in redistricting, for instance, voters in Virginia overwhelmingly approve turning it over to a an commission. independent commission. How's that working out? That has just collapsed, and it's working out great for the Republicans. Yes. So, the anyway. same thing in Florida. Fair districts. Right. And we're going to wind up picking up, in, I mean, not only the seats like, we're going to pick up by any I mean, seats, when you take a look at, for example, even in, I think, both 18 and 20, if you look at every, you know, congressional district and uh, the de Democrats beat in total vote, it's kind of like the national vote versus the electoral mm -hmm. vote and how that ex should extrapolate out in terms of the number of seats we have is ridiculous how many number of seats we don't have because of redistricting. Anyway. Thank you, thank supercomputers. You. Okay. Thank you. Hi, so uh, I'm Sanjay Srivatsan, a first year at the, at the college at the university. And um, my question is about uh, liberal states in the Northeast and Maryland. So when you have states like Vermont and Maryland, where there's popular Republican governors, but the states are very liberal, is it a possibility that if the governors run for Senate that they can still win, or has their nation become too partisan for that? Well, I think this is what makes America great. Vermont, the bluest of blue states, Massachusetts, Maryland, they all have Republican governors. My can clients, John Bell Edwards in Louisiana, um, you know, has a Democratic governor. You know, Roy Cooper uh, won twice in a Trump state of North Carolina. This just show I mean, you know, uh, Virginia is a plus 10 state that yeah. just went yeah. for, for Yunkin. I mean, the fact is, is that there's not a state, Kansas has a Democratic governor, yeah. right? There's not a state out there that can't, in the right circumstances, in the right environment, and to your point, the right candidate, Doug Jones, won a Senate race in Alabama. Might yep. have been short-lived. This, this stuff can really happen. As far as your question, there is the people who govern those states are, being a governor is different than being a senator. I think John it's would like agree. like a big mayor. Yeah, it is, it, is, it is a lot about job approval. It is a lot about how you, you know, how you get things done for people, the perception of how you do your job. People don't really know what senators do. They don't follow legislation, but they know if their roads you know, are clean and all the rest of that stuff. And I think Hogan and Baker and 
the guy in Vermont, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. That's uh, Scott, right. Oh, my God, that's horrible. Um, old age. Uh, but I think they have forged a combination of job performance and cult of personality, if you will, that kind of insulates them from uh, and they're moderates. the partisans. If you have moderates yeah. in your party. You know, the yeah. truth of the matter is they real. I mean, maybe Baker is, but I mean. Scott is. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they agree, you know, 70% with most Republican things, more than they agree with anything the Democrats do. But it's, they're not perceived to be ideological. Right. That's, the, that's the key for them. Just as a hypothetical, suppose before the 2022 election, Donald Trump is indicted for seditious conspiracy and the indictment lays out credible facts. What would be the effect on the 2022 and 2024 election. Like you could imagine that that would be, it could be a signal for Republicans to abandon Trump or- Or to rally behind him. Well, would, or Trump could pull Eugene Debs and be elected president from jail. So which would it be? So we're, we're pollsters, so we're too linear for hypotheticals, but I'm gonna give that one to you and then I'll- Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't even. I don't, even know. I don't think it matters. I'll help you. I don't I, think no, it no. I, I, I mean, it, listen. I, I, Donald Trump has a core of supporters who are going to support him no matter what. That core may wane over time, but the fact of the matter is, right now there has been little to no erosion of that core. There really yeah. hasn't inside the Republican Party. Right. Um, he went through two impeachments. He didn't lose. He didn't lose his core support. Um, I hate to say this, and I'm going to get booed by the audience. But, you know, everything that's going on in D.C. with January 6th, did anybody see a January 6th impact on the Virginia governor's race and the New Jersey governor's race? No. So voters have the capacity to look beyond and vote what their interest is at that moment in time. Well, I think voters also have the capability of literally looking like this. I mean, like, you know. Yeah, you but, know I mean, no, I mean, and, and I don't mean that blind. to be a smart ass. No. I mean, there, there is a universe of voter who clearly is putting their head in the sand about facts or, you know, so, and they're, and they're, you know, the fact is I don't, I think that it could embolden his um, supporters. I think that there's a universe of supporter that they're worried about not getting out. Like, for example, in January of 19, when you had the runoff elections in Georgia, without a doubt, there was a drop-off in Republican voters because Absolutely. Trump wasn't on the ticket. And then in Virginia, you know, you he have... He was also urging Republicans well, to I mean, not come out. Right. But, 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 but again, the, the fact is I will still lean towards these people are coming out. But tell me what you're saying, I don't mean to put words in your... But are you saying that no matter what, for instance, the January 6th committee <laughs> comes up with, no matter who they subpoena, no matter assuming whatever no, documents. No, what I'm saying are... is a lot of that stuff is baked into the cake. It was baked into the cake. And it didn't impact Republican turnout. It didn't hurt Republicans' chances. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't, it's just like the first impeachment. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everybody thought that the first impeachment was going to be, I, I think John and I would both agree that the first impeachment, by the time we got to November of 20, was like that was a distant that was so far in the mirror behind yeah. so many things had happened and the same is going to happen here too um so I, I don't see him losing his base that easily as people think it is it's not that easy to shake free it from him he's still the guy the one thing he said he's still the guy who says he could go down fifth avenue and shoot someone and not i mean this is coming true i mean you know the litany of things against him um this is really coming true Thank you. Hi, my name is Graham. I'm a first year student at the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, so you guys both talked about how certain people aren't real Americans, um, academics, people in Washington. I, I, people talk a lot about you, know, you Chicago people as not being real Americans. I was born here. I lived here my whole life. Do you think there's any future where people stop talking about academics or educated people as not being real America or Chicago not being real America? And this is, goes to also Car James Carville, who talks about, you know, faculty lounge politics and that sort of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think we said that up here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that there is a universe of, of there's, a thing, there's things that happen in D.C. that are, um, there's a gap. There's a gap between what Huge. they're thinking is real and is a narrative and what, you know, whatever, real people. He, when I mean real people outside of literally this bubble of Congress and political 
elitists, right? Um, Give me I some examples. Well, one other thing before I forget is I think Twitter's not real, right? I mean, like, if you, take a, if you take a look at what's going on on Twitter versus, again, the percentage of people in America who actually look at it, whatever, there can be this disconnect. And, you know, I think the disconnect is the biggest problem. I think that there's a disconnect between, you know, Congress, Democrat, Republican, whatever, and the political elite that run D.C. Um, and yeah, what's going on. Like, I live in Montgomery, Alabama. He lives in Fort Lauderdale. Florida, Florida. Florida, right? Like, he lives in a Democratic place. I live in a Republican place. That's probably a pretty good for your pollster, right? Right. We have a little bit of reality check. Um, and I watch no cable TV. Never seen Jake Tapper. Never seen Rachel Maddow. Never seen Chris Cuomo. I, I mean, it's like, I don't watch Fox. And he doesn't watch Fox. I, what, I guess what, my what, point what, is, what, is what, I'm what? worried about the disconnect. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with him more. I, I will say the following, uh, and I don't believe we said you people in Chicago or anything like that. I, I don't believe we disparaged in any way. But there is, a, there is a segment of the American voting public, the voting population, who feel that they are looked down upon and that they have been looked down yeah, upon by the elites in Washington who make fun of them because of what they believe, because of how they believe it, because of how they worship, because of all of those things. And I will tell you, it is the underlying, the undercurrent. It is what Donald Trump tapped into very early on in his presidential campaign. And that is what people do not understand. That group of people who feel like they are looked down upon, whether it's directly through words or through a disconnect with values, is really the long-term problem and, I see for the Democrats. And how does race figure into this? Oh, that's a, well, first of all, there is such a huge disconnect between white and African-American opinions on racial justice in this country. There, there just is. Um, during the, I'm sure John saw this, during the defund the police uh, argument during the campaign, um, even white Democrats didn't want to defund right, the police. Yeah. You know what I'm but, saying? And, and, and the attitudes towards the police and the violence was just so disconnected. I don't know how you put that back together when there are just, there's a reality, not a reality, there is a perception among white voters that is totally disconnected by the reality that African American voters live. And I don't know how you bridge that. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you have some suggestion or, or you you know you've seen something in your data, but I certainly haven't seen anything that Well does I'll take it one step it. further. There's a disconnect often between how policymakers believe African Americans or people of color think on policy. Oh, oh wow, that, absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, if you're a pollster for 30 or 40 years, you kind of understand that African Americans are some of the most, at, on different issues, some of those moderate to conservative voters out there. And yep. so there's also this wrong narrative about, oh, what African Americans believe or what Latinos believe, et cetera. Latinx is the perfect example. <laughs> No Latino or Hispanic wants to be called Latinx. It became this thing that was created about, again, by this, I don't even know who it was. We asked the question, Latinos want to be, be uh, identified by their nationality. I'm Colombian, right. I'm Cuban, Cuban, I'm Mexican, Mexican. et cetera. Guatemala, so like, we come up with these, like, the, these disconnects even when we're trying to represent a, uh, a, a minority or a person of color. It's, it's strange. Let me tell you, to, to, to underscore that point is, um, you know, one of the stories that came out of 2020 um, was that actually uh, Trump did better with Hispanics than he had done previously. Um, and also Virginia. The, yep. the, the well, exit the two polls, exit polls were different. They, but, but they did better. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Oh, he did better. We know, our internal polling. He, he did better. Did better. Uh, Youngkin, it, I mean, McAuliffe well, did, better, did yeah. underperform. And by the way, what, what in all polling in New Jersey, Chitterelli was doing better with Hispanics than yeah. uh, 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 the previous Republican candidate had done. But because one of the, the Democrats have considered yeah. this identity politics, or no, or no I don't think. It, I actually think it's probably more about what the Republicans are doing than what the. You know, you know what I'm saying? That's my take on it. I think it's very if, economic. If you go back to February of 2020, before coronavirus, if anybody, get, 
take your minds back to that day where there was no masks, no vaccines, you know, and you could actually fly in an airplane and eat a bag of peanuts without having to worry about the person next to you yelling at you to put your mask back on. Um, in February, um, I had delivered a set of numbers to Trump. And at that time, we were getting in the mid to high teens among African American votes, and we were in the mid 40s with Hispanics. And it was primarily powered by African American men yeah, younger and men. Hispanic men, and it was economic based. They had finally felt the impact of the economic growth, and they were responding to it. And now, of course, COVID came along, and a lot of that, you know, shattered and went away. But it's this misconception, as John said, that there's only one way to reach these voters, and they only respond to one message. When in fact, there are many ways to reach them and many ways to get them. Yeah, if you're in D.C., I swear to God, I mean, I, I've had this fight a million times. It's like. You know, you believe that uh, if you're talking to Latinos, they only want to hear about immigration. No. One of the weakest issues among yes. Latinos is immigration. Yes. Not that they're not, you know, they don't believe in dreamers and pathway to citizenship and all that type of stuff. Guess what the, the top issues are? Just like any other Caucasian, or, you know, it's, it's economic, Economics. and it's health care, yep. and it's education, yep. right? And so, again, there's this disconnect um, uh, in terms of, you know, how we communicate. And I don't say just, uh, this isn't just a Democrat, how we can, but how, you know, people uh, communicate what the narrative yep. becomes uh, about certain demographics, including non-college whites. <laughs> you know, like there's, there, you can take almost every demographic group and there is a, almost a kind of a targeting narrative that is often wrong. Yes. Leave it to Washington to get everything wrong. Um, hi, my name is Sophie. I'm a third year in the college studying public policy, and I have a question particularly for you, uh, Mr. Anzalone. Um, I've just been listening to the coverage, and everybody's talking about the gubernatorial races in Virginia and New Jersey as this blowout. It's a horrible, it's a horrible sign for Democrats, and you yourself kind of said that tonight. But I'm just curious, um, in the New Jersey race, it was the first Democratic governor to win re-election in 44 years. Um, the race between, I mean, in Virginia was only a three-point margin. It didn't seem like a blowout to me. And Democrats just won huge in California. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more to that narrative of it being such a, such a disaster, and if you think yeah. it is, why? Well, I mean, the reality is, is that a loss is a loss, right? I mean, the fact is, is that if Virginia is a plus 10 Biden state and you lose by three, it's a 13-point swing. I mean, that is, that's really rough. It's hard to lose a plus 10 state, really hard. It's, it's almost as hard as losing a plus 16 state, which yeah. they almost did in New Jersey. Right, which almost in New and, Jersey. And by the way, in New Jersey, in, in uh, Virginia, um, I saw uh, uh, an analysis of the spend, and McAuliffe and Democrat-aligned groups <coughs> outspent Yunkin and the Republican-aligned groups by about $2 million. But and isn't part of the problem, too, that you mentioned California, that a lot of Democrats nationally saw what happened in California, so they just assumed that's a super big it's problem. All about Trump. I mean, wow. you know, it's just a super big problem because there wasn't an alternative for, for Newsom. Newsom's job rating was what 58 percent by the time yeah. that vote came. His, you know, opponent became kind of clownish, uh, right? Larry, um, what, right? <laughs> you know, and and the fact is so. And Youngkin was real, and he ran a real campaign, and he wasn't scary, and he had a good and, message. And by the way, that is a plus 30 Democrat state. And one of the things that they did very effectively there, and you, he knows this, is they recognized that they had an enthusiasm problem. Yeah, and they went out there and, and they worked it yeah. really, really hard. But Newsom did, and the campaign did a better job of branding el elders. Is that his name? Larry right. Larry. I mean, I, just like every campaign's different. But I'll tell you what, in the 30 years I've been polling, I've never used California as a bellwether, yeah. except for like for coffee anything. or, you know, Netflix or, you know, yeah. things that are, right? I, I have four kids. That's helpful. Like, you know, yeah. what are you seeing in California? Yeah. Um, but, you know, the fact is, is that it was a rough night for Democrats and, you know, no, we're not going to like again put our head in the sand. But I do believe that we have what we can, what we need to be competitive. Is it going to be easy? No. You know, is a lot of this atmospherics? Yes. 
Um, and can you change the atmospherics? Well, we certainly hope some of that happens naturally, but you also have to take destiny in your own hand and have a heck of a message to tell people what you're going to do for them. By the way, the point I was making about the difference between New Jersey and Virginia is while the Democrats outspent the Republican by about $2 million in, in, in Virginia, there was a $6.5 million gap in New Jersey. Right. And if that had not existed, that race may and have been different we, there, too. And we really should focus. If you're doing an analysis of the political environment and economic environment, it should be Jersey. And here's why. One, there was a real race in Virginia. And it's right next to Washington, D.C. So everything, ugh, yep. it's like it's, you know, it gets polluted, et cetera, et cetera. You had Terry McAuliffe, who was quasi-incumbent, yada, yada, yada. Jersey, you have the first most expensive media market in America, New and York. The and the third. Third, third in Phil Philadelphia. Third. And so the communication is really short, short. And so a lot of what was happening there was atmospherics and not so much just about what they were doing. And so the true analysis of what was what's probably happened um, in, in 2021 should probably be a little bit more focused on Jersey. Damn it. Thanks. Um, we're beginning to sort of come, I think, to the end of our time, but I think we have... But there is a pub downstairs. Right. <laughs> but we have time for one or maybe two more questions. As long as John and I aren't long-winded in our responses. Right. Yeah, I think there's two of us here. Is that right? What's his name? Uh, um, can, I, can I lower my mask to speak in the microphone? Hi, so I'm Rory. I'm a master's student here with the Committee on International Relations. So the, the fact is midterm elections are always hard for the, pre the party that's in power, and Biden's approval rating, according to Gallup two days ago, is 38%. I, I'm interested to hear from both of you, starting with John Antoloni. What do you think the chances are that a year from today the Republicans control the House and the Senate? And then, Mr. Fabrizio, I'm interested to hear from well, you as well. Well, I, I, would, I would go to 538 or RCP to see your average, right? That's really the better place because they aggregate and et cetera. So it's probably a little over, it's 43%, I think, today, et cetera. Okay. So, I mean, I'll take the five points, brother, right? <laughs> um, and I think that, you, you, you know, given where we are with the, uh, you know, the political environment and the Biden job rating, I don't think that there's any one odds maker in D.C. or Vegas who's going to say, you know, that there's great chances that the, the, um, uh, that the Democrats are going to keep the House. I think we have a better chance in the Senate just because of those dynamics and the candidates matter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think we will be competitive. But I don't think there's anyone out there who doesn't believe that the Republicans have a pretty decent advantage going into the 2022 elections. And I'm not going to lie about it. I, I, for me, I, I would put our odds of taking back the House 85 oh, I wouldn't percent plus, 90 percent plus. Yeah. Um, in terms of the Senate, I think the Senate's a little bit trickier. Um, but I would say that our chances of taking back the Senate are probably about 60 percent. Um, I'm, I'm bullish. Uh, on, on our chances. I love uh, that. Yes, I, I know. That. You, you want to disappoint me on Election Day in 2022. Oh. But I'll be here to have a shoulder for you to cry on <laughs> in 2022. All right. Thank you both. Okay, You're welcome. Great. Hi, uh, Zach. Tony, great to see you. Uh, <laughs> I'm Tony's ambassador. Uh, this is Zach Brand, second year at Harris. John, this is for you. Thank you so much for coming. We've had enough of Tony. We need to hear your perspective. I can uh, never get enough of Tony. I don't, I I don't blame this. you. I love this guy. Uh, I'll keep this short because that was basically what my question was. But really, um, I think a lot of people question Democrats claiming that the, the infrastructure bill that we just had passed is a victory because it was fairly bipartisan. Um, how are the Democrats going to address this I think this last election, a lot of it was a failure of messaging. How are they going to better address this going into 2022 if economic conditions either get worse or don't change? Because it seems like there's going to be a lot of difficulty getting any sort of Biden's agenda or the more progressive yeah. agenda passed because they're going to risk <clears throat> right. being not So really I think to be fair, when you're in an off year of the midterm, it's not as if there was a Democratic message. Like, right, you have two candidates, one in Virginia and one in, in New Jersey. And so I think it's a, it's a little unfair, not just by you, but by the media, et cetera, that there wasn't a message. I think that what really hurt was for the last two and a half months, we've been talking process. 
You know, we the, the sausage is being, uh, everyone's seeing the sausage be made in a very diverse party where you have the cinnamon mansions and you have the AOCs and, and uh, J. Pauls, et cetera. That is ugly. That is really, really ugly. I think I laid out what I believe is going to be really strong messaging in 2022. And I think that that, again, being able to say what we have done for people is going to be really important. I'm not so much talking about the infrastructure bill, but I'm talking about the things that I believe are going to impact um, uh, um, working families. But quite frankly, if you're Haley Stevens in Michigan, which has the worst roads in America, and you're able to talk about um, roads and the fact that $10 billion or whatever it is is coming to Michigan, there might be some value to that as well. I think, yeah, sorry, I didn't articulate it clear enough. Is anything else going to get done? That Democrats can <laughs> yeah, do I mean, I think that we're going to have this bill that lowers health insurance costs, lowers uh, prescription drugs, elderly care, child care, et cetera. And is that it? No, no vo voting reform. No. I mean, you know, you, you, you all may want more, but I don't know what else can, uh, what else is going to get done. But I'll tell you the big things that are going to impact people and lower their 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 household budgets is pretty you know, pretty tremendous. This, the new White House comms director uh, <laughs> sitting to my right here. I just, can I leave on one thought? Or was there another question? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. One thought. Um, in the eventuality, I am right and John is wrong. And 2022. About which thing? About the elections in 2022. Oh, okay. I wasn't. We're right about everything I else. I said you had the, the <laughs> No, 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 you no, were no, gonna... no, wait, 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 wait. If, if, in the uh, eventuality, that's the case. Uh, I think Looking beyond 2022, I think here is the real challenge for Democrats, in all seriousness. When they, if they lose the majority, the people that lose are going to be the moderates in their party or the more practical liberals well, that sure, are in Marshall District. Case, yeah. Which means you don't have it. that the caucus, I didn't say we did, uh, which means that the caucus, the Democratic caucus in the House, the progressives are going to have a larger voice. And if they lose the Senate, the Senate is going to look at the House. The House is going to be looking at the Senate, and it's going to become even more problematic. Now, there is an opportunity there. That opportunity would be for President Biden to triangulate from the, his own progressives, much like Clinton did back in the 90s, where he was able to triangulate himself between the Republicans and his own party to make himself out to be a true centrist. No, yeah, BIF. Really, yeah. Okay, you told you said the challenges. Here's your challenge of the Republican Party. I can't at accept some that. point <laughs> at some point the Republican Party is gonna have to stand for something and have literally we an, do. an economic stronger borders. An economic Lower plan. Taxes, because I'll tell you, I actually believe the, markets, the, the wedge issues beating up on China. are playing themselves out because they didn't work against Biden. Do I, am I naive enough to believe that they don't work? I really do. But at some point, they're going to play themselves out, and people aren't going to believe it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and call, call time, time here. Time out. And thank you both for an thank you, absolutely thank you. fascinating evening. And we'll find out who's right a year from now.